As I mentioned yesterday, it's really wonderful that more women are becoming involved in this subject. And our next speaker, Paula Harris, who I got to meet for the very first time yesterday, and what an absolutely incredible joy she is uh, as a human being and to talk to about this phenomenal subject. And her research is so groundbreaking. And as she is on personal terms with many of the leading researchers in the field, Paula sheds a tremendous amount of light on the subject, which may not have been shared in such a way before. Paula is an Italian-American photojournalist and investigative reporter in the field of extraterrestrial-related phenomena research. She's also a widely published freelance writer, especially in Europe, and the author of the book Connecting the Dots, and has studied the ET phenomena since 1979. From 1980 to 1986, she assisted Dr. J. Allen Hynek with his UFO investigations and has interviewed many top military witnesses concerning their involvement in the government truth embargo. She's a longtime collaborator with Dr. Roberto Pinotti, director of the Center Ufologico Nacional. So let us learn more about an international perspective. Please welcome Paula Harris. Thank you so much, Tracy. It was an honor to meet you, too. And it is wonderful to be here with all of you. And it is also wonderful to know that there are so many women in the field. And I feel a sisterhood with you because it hasn't been easy. And I was trying to think of what I would call my talk here because I've done so many talks on whistleblowers and on my book and on all the interviews. And I came up with this today. I said, OK, you know what I'd like to do? I want to do this talk and call it, I have a dream. I said, but it won't be like Martin Luther King's, even though I support the change in paradigm that Martin Luther King caused. But I'll tell you what my dream is. My dream is that CNN, NBC, ABC, and all the major networks are here to get the information after all these years. My dream is that young people are sitting in this audience from the age of 10 to onward with our colleagues who have been at this for so long. I have talked to so many of you people that have been working in this field and researching and hanging in there and frustrated and asked me, when is it going to happen? And I have to ask you the, to, one thing. You have done so much work. Do you want to, it to, just to disappear with you, or do you want to start bringing in some young people so this can go on? This is important work that needs to go on, and I want to talk about some of the top players, people like John Mack, who came to Italy um, a year ago and talked to a group of young ufologists Gruppo Ufologico di Firenze, and nobody was over the age of 30. They put that conference on in a major auditorium that was attached to a rebuilt convent, and he was impressed that somewhere in the world, young people were also involved in this phenomenon. I have to share this dream with you because, you know, it, it, a lot of us have been working very, very hard. It, it may not look like a bit. In 1979 till today, I had a dream that disclosure would have happened. And I really think that part of that is incorporating our young people in our schools, our educational system. It's got to go out there. So I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. The other thing I'd like to say is that so many of you in the audience are my colleagues. I respect your work tremendously. I read your books. I bring it to Europe. You don't know how respected you are. You don't know that a lot of what you have written has been translated to other languages. Have faith. You have no idea how this is spreading abroad, and that's what I'm here to tell you. And I want to thank one particular person here, because if it wasn't for him, I would not have been steered on the, on the proper path. If you have read my book, Connecting the Dots, it talks about my journey in ufology. 
My book, Connecting the Dots, talks about my early life at Broomfield High School as a teacher of science fiction. It talks about the serendipitous meeting with Alan Hynek. It talks about my translating the Italian um, sightings for Hynek, but it talks about one person who was spectacular in helping me in this journey, and that is a researcher, Richard Sigismund, who is in the audience today. Richard, I love you. If it wasn't for you, I probably wouldn't be where I am today looking at this scientifically. There, I have so much respect for the people initially that were working. Leonard Stringfield, Alan Hynek, John Schusler. John Schusler was at that meeting in 1980 where <clears throat> I brought Dr. Panati from Italy. I talk about this because at that time in 1980, John was doing the Cash Landum cave, and we had no real um, footage or we didn't have really good pictures of UFOs. Uh, so Alan said, would you bring Panati because you get them from the Air Force. We did. We got the slides from the Air Force. Panati uh, had gone, Dr. Panati had gone to the Air Force to ask for them. It is not unusual for the Air Force to work with researchers. In the uh, year 2002 at the San Marino Conference, one of the Air Force top brass spoke and said that they were just as confused as we were and they would also like some help that they would give us the sightings. That is not unusual in Europe. And I was on, you must have heard me probably on George Nury Coast to Coast because I did five shows this year. Uh, one of them was with A.J. Gevard because I wanted to tell the American people that the Brazilian situation with the collaboration with the Air Force is not unusual because the French also, the Belgian people also. I think we're getting to a point where it's very, very confusing for everyone and the collaboration has to happen in some way, even if it's token, even if it's let's give you a few files so we keep the researchers quiet and but at least we can share information. It is happening. Um, and I have hope it's going to happen here too. I'm going to show you a lot of different things, so I really have to talk fast because I have almost seven videos of <laughs> information for you. But um, I was on with AJ Gebhardt, but I was also on Nuri for another case that I'm not going to talk about today, but you can get the DVD from Bob Brown because I did talk about it at Laughlin the Charles Hall case, because that changed my life. Uh, this DVD of Charles Hall is one that we made uh, together with David Coote, who is a Frontier Airlines pilot, who I called in on the case because it was such an unusual case, you know, that probably now you all know about the Charles Hall case. Two years ago, I met him. There was no way I was going to talk about him until I researched it for a year and a half and asked David Coote, the pilot, to be part of this. Now, the problem I was having with the meteorologist story, and you know that Charles Hall was a meteorologist on the Nellis Base, Indian Springs. It's in the MUFON proceedings, if you want to see that, plus the picture that um, David Coot, who is Frontier Airlines pilot, took of that part of Indian Springs where Charles was uh, stationed. That case had contact of, a contact scenario from 1965 to 1967 before he went to Vietnam with a group of aliens who were tall whites. Group of aliens who had a lifespan of 800 years, but that is not so unusual. What was unusual for me, a researcher of 30 years, was that they had their children with them. So what the problem was for me, when I listened to the Charles Hall story, his books are out there, and also Charles Hall spoke at the Laughlin Conference, um, was if this is so, and I'm not going to go into details of that story except how I researched it, if this is so, if we have had these people hosted on a base, what are the implications for humanity? Some of these people look like us. Example, the case of Adamski, and I talked to Ron Garner about this because he's very interested in the 50s. We took that seriously because Adamski came to Italy. He is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Somebody should reopen that case. The people he met were, were humanoid type who looked very much like humans. We had a case in, very important case in Sicily, Eugenio Seracusa. A 
also in the 50s meets these human white type people. Uh, and Eugenio was part of a small community in Catania, and all kinds of people saw these humanoid type aliens. They saw the ship land. They saw them get off the ship. These are people that are not sophisticated enough to make this up. A lot of research was done uh, with the with Eugenio Siracusa case, and just recently, I have found that Eugenio Siracusa has four letters from President Eisenhower. One of them I have seen. And so I, before Eugenio uh, leaves us, and he's 93 years old, I would like to understand why and how he was taken seriously in the 50s. And what interests me anymore is the fact that, yes, I, I like the idea that we have different races, and I probably will talk a little bit about the grays and, and different races, but the humanoid type people that have visited us are those people that can mix in with this humanity. And then I begin thinking, well, if that's the case, we're dealing 1950, 1965, maybe we should be going beyond the sightings and looking at the political and social implications of contact. So I'm going there. I am going there because that's where it's going to take us. I want to know what the implications are. And like Charles, or unlike Charles, who was not prepared for this, I want to know what the expectation is if we are to meet with these people from other places. Now, what does that mean? There is an emergence of a discipline, and I hope it becomes a discipline, called exopolitics. It started with Dr. Michael Sala and Alfred Weber. And we talked about this in different conferences. And I have to bring this up because we're going from ufology, we're going to another paradigm. We're taking all the wonderful work the people have done all the years, and we're looking at it philosophically and politically. Dr. Roberto Pinotti is having a conference in Calabria on the 8th, 7th, 8th, and 9th of October that has 32 speakers worldwide and four from America. And it's called Exo Astronomy, which means Exo from other realms, and Exo Politics. So Dr. Pinotti is going there. So there's a lot of different people because we have to take that step. OK, now, if, I don't even remember Carl Sagan. He did exobiology. And Carl Sagan knew that he had to call it something else. It's a matter of semantics. It's still ufology. But what it is is taking the focus away from just sightings to implications. And also, when we get these stories, like the Charles Hall story that has no place to be put, where are you going to put that? I mean, when I started doing Charles Hall, I thought I was going nuts. That's what I, I said. I have nothing here to compare that with. Of course, later on, I did. And I have to add another thing very quickly, because I don't want to spend a lot of time on that case, is that if it weren't for a LAPD retired policeman who heard me on George Nury, who went to find the other three witnesses, because you try to find witnesses after 40 years without hiring a private detective, it's impossible. If it wasn't for this man who found these four witnesses, and chase them, and the LAPD can do it in two seconds. Uh, and we call them to ask about Charles and his being stationed there and about the phenomenon and so forth. If we hadn't done that, I, could, I would have never released the story. And not only that, but uh, also concurrently, we asked uh, this uh, sergeant in the LAPD, could he get us a forensic artist to do an identikit, what we call in Italian, an identikit, but what it is is a forensic drawing of an alien. Now, that's never been done. When the, LA, when the Anaheim Police Department does a forensic drawing of an alien, for me, that becomes serious business. It is no longer ridicule. It is no longer in the back burner. It is no longer in the ghetto, as Stephen Bassett says, because she signed it. So these are things that we can do. I hope I'm giving you some stimulation to think about and some ideas besides drawing in young people, drawing in other uh, groups. Uh, from society, because this is serious business. OK, I'm going to go on really quickly, because my presentation is an international perspective. I have so much to show you that we don't even have time to go through it all. But really quickly, I want to tell you that when I come to the United States, and it's only in the summer, I go to where the story is. Now, does that cost money? Yes. Where do I get it? I teach school. Nobody subsidizes anything here. My mother is very angry, so is my family. But that's where the money goes. I go to Phoenix because it's at Phoenix, people. I'm sorry, but 
I go to Phoenix because I have to see why there are lights appearing now in Phoenix and there is a crop circle there. Go to my website and find out about the Tulsa crop circle that appeared all over South Mountain or under South Mountain that has cuneiform writing. Now, is that just something out there? No. Uh, the nodes of the grain, and it's barley, have been already analyzed by Dr. Levengood. Is that the latest? Yes. That's the latest. It's on my website, but then I'm asking myself as a journalist, what are those lights still doing appearing there? Then we have this message here underneath that nobody can read because it's probably, and we don't have scholars interested in this. Um, and I'm supposed to speak there on the 14th, and what happens is the day before I come there, I have been getting communication from a security guard who works in a gravel uh, mine situation, and he has been, he heard me on Nuri, and he's already mailed me several of his digital, uh, he's let me see several of his digital photos, but the day that I'm speaking there, he brings this footage. I, I would like you to see this because it's only a few seconds long, but this happened the 13th of July, which means those lights are still there. Let's, can we show that? And somebody needs to go there because I can't go back. So, um, can we show those? You'll see two lights, and then all at once you'll see four. You see those two? Those strobes are from the airport, but the two lights that you're looking at right there are, there's two, they will fade out, and they will be all at once, there will be four, and then they will, the two bottoms will uh, go away. Now, I haven't, I would be glad to give copies of this footage to anybody that wants it, because he is, uh, he wants to, not be known. He, uh, he has filmed them several times. He's very confused like everybody else. He's out there from uh, 9 o'clock to 3 in the morning. And these lights are appearing in South Mountain. This, this film footage is from the 13th of uh, July. Now, I've never seen a UFO, so I'm thinking to myself, wow, after I do my talk, we can, we can turn that off now and, and put the other one in. Um, I'm going out there, and maybe this is the first time I get to see something. So yeah, I'm out there from 9 o'clock till midnight. It's 118 degrees in Phoenix. I'm out there, and I don't see anything. And of course, I'm disappointed because in my lifetime, I hope to see something. I'm always trying. Uh, but I'm talking to him to see what his credibility factor is, and he's extremely credible. Uh, he wished I could see it. Uh, he says that this phenomenon has been happening for the last month. Uh, the crop circle, he pointed where it was on the map. I have photos of all this, which I'll put on my website um, shortly. And I really believe that someone should go there and follow up. Because when you do that, I translate it into Italian. People take it in German. People copy it in French. And it gets out to the world. And people know that this phenomenon is ongoing. It just happens to be in Phoenix right now. Okay, so the next video, please. The entire phenomenon is very confusing, but I'm bringing you material from Italy. This is over the base of Aviano in northern Italy. This is where we have uh, our planes leave for the Middle East during the Gulf War. And if you look very closely, this is the stealth, and there's two little UFOs over it. That was very recently, about three years ago. And also, um, it was an air show. So that wasn't the only film footage there was of the two UFOs that went over the stealth. And it, let's remember that, that real good research is looking at the whole entire picture. When this happens, where it happens, and how it happens. And this is over the base of Aviano. So Aviano has had many, many stories. I actually did a conference in northern Italy near Venice. Um, and, and we can keep that up because you need to look at this. Now, I'm not going to say very much. This was also given to me, the same film footage. I'll be quiet because you need to, to see this. Um, we have a confusing situation in ufology. This is near Aviano also.
Okay, what we need to have happen, I, I put it on twice so we can leave this video on because, you know, I did it twice because I knew you wanted to see that there's a stuff the book. Now, when I first saw that, my first thought, because I've seen so much film footage, is I wonder whose stuff that is. So I would like you to see it again, then we'll have a little discussion about this, that other film footage. Now, that's circulating in northern Italy because um, we researchers have gotten this footage now. That we know what it is. We know those are two UFOs. They're not playing games. It's, you know, they filmed it at an air show. That should keep going. It's slow motion, but we should there. Okay. Well, when I saw that as a journalist, my first thought was the photographer knew it was coming because the camera was pointing in that direction. He was, I believe, using a tripod, which means he was invited to do that. For me, that was an air show. It was a little show that that UFO was putting on. and. It was close to, it was a place called Ponte Giulio, which is very close to Aviano, so I said, that's our stuff. And that's probably somebody that was a military photographer that was taking this and is leaking it out. Because otherwise, the contactee would have had to be invited to stand there. He was pointing in the direction of the forest where the, the object came out of. He was, the object has flanges coming in and out, and I think that could possibly be, I've never seen anything like that, so that could possibly be our stuff. And then it takes off in a warp drive, which probably is the case after 40 years if we believe the Charles Hall story and the exchange of technology. And I'm thinking, and other stories, I mean, he's not the only one. There is a whole series of proof that we've been back engineering. But I thought, okay, now what if that happens to be a digital, uh, what do you call those, uh, video game. And, and somebody just shoved that in there. I've got to be careful. So I did show that to some friends of mine in Boulder who are wonderful um, people because they aid me in my work. And these friends of mine gave it to Rachel uh, Summers, who is here present, and she took it to a lab. And her analysis, and she has all the notes on this, showed that that is a real object that it is in the video, it is not just superimposed as some video game. It is the same density. They even knew that it was a fourth generation tape, which it is. I mean, it's amazing how people can analyze, because when she was giving me her notes, I said, you're absolutely right, it is fourth generation tape. Yes, how did they get that? They, they lined it up and everything. It is a real object. The big question is, and that's why I'm interested in the exopolitical field, whose stuff is it? Now, why would I be interested in that? For many reasons. Can we show the next, um, the next DVD, please? This I've shown many times, but I think it's so important for you to see this because I'm very interested in Steven Spielberg. In my book, uh, uh, my second book is going to come out in 2007, and it's going to be called um, UFOs and Exopolitics Problems and Protocols, and I want to cover a whole chapter on Spielberg because I found out that Spielberg had gone to a party at the house of Francis Ford Coppola in the 70s, and who was present besides Jack Sarfati uh, was um, Uri Geller and Jacques Vallée. And when I heard that and I knew that had happened, there is a lot of implications to where Spielberg was going with disclosure. So can we put the DVD in? And 
uh, for the people to see. And I wanted to, to talk to you about, he talks about two things in this DVD. The uh, young people need to listen, and I'm hoping that we work more with young people. And he talks about the idea of aliens, because if we're looking at society and disclosure movies, we need to look at if we see a Foo Fighter, some kind of battle of the war of the world, is it our stuff or is it their stuff? For me, it's very, very important that we discriminate and we do heavy research in this area uh, because I can tell you for those people that camp out, and I will never do this, at Area 50 when I watch all the, the modern technology come up there and they can't tell the difference and so forth, uh, it gets very confusing, and, and I would not want to make any mistake like that. It's a major mistake. Uh, any questionnaire, you said that you hate people and people do not listen. I want to take this advice of young people who don't often want to listen. What is the advice that you would give to young people who don't want to listen? Well, we could hear the voice if we don't have the video. says, I do believe in aliens. Because she had asked him at the end of, she had asked him at the end of the, the interview, do you believe in aliens? Which is, he, now, he won't go on uh, television saying that, now, but Tom Cruise just did. And uh, he has never put that in Close Encounters, but if he was friends with Alan, and I'm gonna talk a lot about Alan, Today, and he talked to Jacques, and you're going to see Jacques today. Can we please start putting the dots together here, connecting the dots? I also want to uh, really um, thank my colleagues that are present because not only do you encourage me, I am encouraged that you take some of this research and use it for yourselves. I am very discouraged with the, not only the debunking, but the negativity and the infighting in the UFO community. I have watched TV here, and I've got to be honest with you, we don't do that. We present a story, and people are intelligent enough to figure it out. We don't have somebody at the end of the, the uh, History Channel special, like was on Colonel Corso, uh, debunking the whole thing, calling the man a liar, uh, point blank. That doesn't happen, especially when people like, uh, people that are, you know, older, like Colonel Corso and other people who decide to come forth and are doing it for their grandchildren. Now, we had his grandchildren in Italy. I will talk about him. Uh, and he wanted to leave something behind. You don't call somebody like that a liar unless you do your homework. Colonel Corso was with us for two solid years. You will see our film footage on him. Thank the Lord Bob Wood and his wife will be visiting Italy in October, because I will not only put them in contact with my editor, I will show them the material he left us. Because the History Channel, when they heard about us, would not come to Italy to see that part of the Corso story, which is the most legitimate part of the Corso story. Because we translated his book the day after Roswell in Italian, and we did so much research on him. He was the head of intelligence from 1944 to 1946. He did the Battle of Monte Cassino. He was in World War II. He was very well respected. There's Italian books on him. There's also, he did the Korean War. This is a man that when he was faced with those people, when he looked at them in the face, he'd say, were you there? 
Did you work at the Pentagon? Were you there? Were you with me and General Trudeau? Were you involved? He was even on the Warren Commission. So, and I, I and the things he did for the POWs, uh, the in, in Washington. This is a man that it is a shame and a disgrace to take lightly. But then his book grossed a lot of money, which he never received. His book, for me, is the single most important book coming out of um, on that subject after a long time. There's been so many wonderful researchers on Roswell. I mean, Stanton is wonderful. The people who worked on the Roswell story are great. But my dream, I have a dream. I have a dream that all the people that worked on Gulf Breeze get together at a table and talk about Gulf Breeze face to face. Not all the people that work on Roswell, all the people that work on one story. I do not work on crop circles. I work on different si uh, parts of ufology. I do not work on contact scenario. But if I, all the, my colleagues that work in my area, and usually they are military witness intelligence people, if we could sit at a table, I'd learn so much from them instead of saying negative things about them. So I really encourage you to go in another direction in this country because I, it confuses people so much to see these shows with all this research done and some of it left out and then have somebody just cancel it out with one word. It is not, for me, very intelligent. Let's go on to John Mack, and I have to do that. <laughs> Meeting John Mack changed my life. I just told you I, I, I don't do contact scenario because I'm not good at it, not because I don't want to know about abductions and contact, but I'm just I'm so confused about it because it's very hard for me to see if people are telling the truth and then there's all kinds of um, you know, emotional and esoteric things around it. But I did put one contact story in my book, and that is the story of Alex Collier, and I'm going in that direction because I will be going to England to interview the Jason Andrews, to do the Jason Andrews story for you people that were in Laughlin. Uh, that impressed me a lot, the indigo child, and I have to go in that direction. But then I'm learning. I started nuts and bolts. I never wanted to touch paranormal. I, I never wanted, in the end of my book is Uri Geller, Remote Viewing and Paranormal. So I'm learning. Uh, I want to encourage you to be flexible enough to learn too. Can we go to the John Mack video? Now John came to this uh, conference that these young people had invited him to. He had a nickname for them. He called them the Gowsers. And um, it was in this uh, place in, in this convent, and you'll see it right here. Uh, you can see it's a. We have our our there conferences in different places, and he is talking to way, a contactee, you know, the one with this baseball cap. This is amazing. Jay York, um, this is. I mean, Leonardo is known for just this kind of thing, you know. Speak up, Leonardo. Like Leonardo. Uh, uh, this contact. Like, it's like this. You don't think this is weird? What are those symbols around that guy? Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, that's Leonardo da Vinci. Stuff that's happening. Ah, uh, okay. I know, but più che lui ha detto che se viene direttamente tra Leonardo diverso che tu studi Leonardo per fare lo studio esce così. Lui pensa che tu hai un contatto diretto. Tutti modi lui ha capito proprio a parte. He said he said he really is happy because you understand exactly. Che io con Leonardo ho saputo di tutto e mi sento un continuatore diciamo di Leonardo. He's been he's been trying to explain this to a lot a lot of people a long time. He said that you went right to the point that he has a soul connection with Leonardo. But see, Leonardo's uh, not just an artist. Leonardo uh, had a, a, a vision that transcended this earthly vision. Okay, ha detto Leonardo da Vinci non era solo un, un artista. Lui ha tra, uh, tra come si dice trascendato. There's all sorts of symbolism in. in Leonardo's paintings that nobody has been able to she's, she's that, that, that have adults. to do with birth and with uh, connection with the divine that, 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 that are hidden from the church so the church wouldn't okay. get it. Ci sono tanti simboli dentro le le quadri di Leonardo che sono nascosti dalla chiesa. So ci sono che nessuno sa che Leonardo era poteva essere un contattista, no? Che era un contattista. Leonardo was a contattista. Yeah, that's, that's what I think too. <laughs> no, I, I think we can show. Yeah, he says Leonardo had uh, 
quotes that were hidden in the paintings. And somehow Tony Michelli is downloading these quotes. And look at in our society this Da Vinci Code thing. And this is a contactee who has met with um, a group of ETs that he has uh, drawn and uh, painted and is talking to John about the implications of what he's been told. And evidently, Tony Michelli was told a lot of material that coincides with Zechariah Sitchin material, with the return of Nibiru, with a lot of stuff like that. And then he's going to say to me, has anybody taken on this case? And I said, I can't. We can stop this, this, uh, this video now. This is just a little piece, but you know, I love John Mack. I miss him so much because of his compassion, his open mind, and so forth. And that, was, that would be my memorial to him. He talked to Tony and, uh, and told me that somebody should have taken that case two years ago because this was a major contact scenario. Now, we lost John, so John could not work with Tony Michelli, but I have a painting at my table that Tony Michelli did, a beautiful painting that will be at the Jock Pack Center in Cambridge that has the um, alien that Tony Michelli sees, plus he has the blonde girl that was in, I don't know if it's Dakota Fanning, in, in Taken. He, he has a, a picture of her, he's, he's painted a picture of her, and a gray and uh, John being taken up into a UFO, and a beautiful picture of John uh, right in the center, and I have that painting. Now that painting is huge, and I sent it to the John Max um, Pierce Center uh, in Cambridge, and that goes to show you how transatlantic we're doing a lot of things and how he affected people in, uh, in Italy as well as here. Um, that learning to go in that area for me is a mind stretch because I usually stay in the area that I'm sure about. Uh, the next area I'm going to take you to is an, uh, a, you can put the Cliffstone um, video there, is my, one of my first neophyte videos and interviews that I did with Clifford Stone in 1997. 50th anniversary of Roswell. Who goes to Cliff Stone's house? Victoria Puccaccini from Brazil and Paula Harris from Italy. All the other researchers okay, that are know where they Here I am filming. Uh, 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 he's got uh, the microfilm la, there. And a, uh, the Le Cosa the di Blue Book. You can come over here and, and take a look. These are the files that we've downloaded thus far so that we have blue reduced the files to paper. He's caught so we can make copies for other people. That goes there. He Facts shares about this UFOs. The UFO movie, which they wasn't happy with, they did not want this movie coming out. I got a copy of that movie, by the way. What, what is the UFO movie? UFOs, Unidentified Flying Off. And who made that? This was put out by, it's released right now through United Artists. It's the story of Al Chop's tenure with the Press Information Office at the Pentagon. Wow. It, to me, to this day, it remains the best document, docudrama ever made on Blue Book. On Blue Book. But Blue Book, uh, Alan worked with that. He was told to to uh, explain away all those things, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Well, if you go through some of these reports, you find the out... The swamp exactly, gas stuff, yeah? Exactly what happened. As a matter of fact, they knew it wasn't swamp gas, and he never said it was swamp gas. He, he got there in Michigan. The Air Force says, in a half hour, we got a news conference, have something to tell them. Remember... I hope we can show this because this is I had to fight my way through reporters to interview the witnesses. Other sightings were reported over the area, and a solution from Dr. Heineck and Major Quintanella seemed in the offing. Well, the pressure was mounting for an official explanation. There were more than 60 newsmen jammed in at that news conference. I gave what I thought to be at that time the only scientific explanation possible for the faint lights in the swampy area. I made the statement that it could be swamp gas, and even though I went on to emphasize that I couldn't prove it in a court of law, that that was the full explanation for these sightings. Well, the press picked up the phrase swamp gas and rushed off to the telephones, and I was to come into a great deal of criticism over it. What was the outcome of that congressional hearing? Mm -hmm. He stated that... This is there was something to UFOs that UFOs. has begun, and I he want to talk about this in 62? film in later 62, on. Go ahead. That UFOs, that was a, an incredible event being reported by credible sources. Mm -hmm. 
and he could not escape that. In 62, he did not see anything. In 1965, he wouldn't only see something, but he'd take two photographs of it. Alan? Yes. I did, he never told me he had a sighting. He did. He never told me. He did in have a airplane. sighting in an airplane. And he took two photographs of it. See, this is news for me because I used to ask him, Alan, you know, I never saw anything. Can you tell me something? So, and he took his own photographs of it. I have, I have slides. You have slides I, of in those? Another book, in one of the books he wrote, I can show you the photographs. What? Do you know which book it is in? Sure do. You'll you're excuse kidding. me for a second. I'll go up Absolutely. In other words, it was your job. I'm saying. It was my job to, to, know this. to know this. Okay. It was my job. Here's the two photographs of the object and that he, I next saw. And the, what page is that a UFO experience? Because I think we have it in... in uh, oh, it's in the photo section. It's, it's close to what? Uh, because I'll tell him what easy to look it up. Well, one... What is it? I don't have my glasses on. I think okay. it's 151. It's 151, right. And he took those pictures? He took these photographs. If you <laughs> read right up at the top. And he actually admits to having taken, taken them? Yep. You got him on tape oh, saying yes. you took them, taking them, but the tape was what for the government? Well, actually, it was put out by Edmund Scientific. He did in 1977. He did three, ta uh, three slide interviews narrated by t uh, by audio tape. Mm -hmm. I went ahead and got those, and I use those a lot. Mm -hmm. So I still have those. I still have the tapes. Joe's heard them. I don't know if he can recall that or not, but he says. And the often asked question as to whether I have ever seen a UFO, well, here it is. And that's almost an exact quote, what he says. And did, did you know him at all? I mean, did you ever talk to him? No, but while I was in the military, it was my job to go ahead and have a liaison with him. So I even had the 800 number in Germany. Uh-huh. We never used it. But, of course, we were also the ones that went over the... MP blotters, and if we found anything of any consequence, we would go ahead and ensure all the loops were closed so that nothing would be coming out that shouldn't be coming out. We okay. didn't have the blotters rewritten, even in your country. Okay. You didn't have the what rewritten? We had have the blotters rewritten with the incident of UFOs taken out. So, you know, we know there's a cover up in Italy for sure. I mean, we, do you know of any down saucer in Italy for sure? I mean, any th th anything that you remember? Yeah, are you going to show me? Oh, that's, they're going to love this. And what he did was show me the moon dust, the moon dust files with the Italian crashes, and I was in shock, I, you know, because he has all the crashes. of Because uh, Pacchini then came in with me and said, in Brazil, were there crashes? And he said, yeah. And he pulled out files. <clears throat> they're readily available. I am so surprised that so many researchers have not gone down to speak to Clifford Stone, who, who's ailing, by the way. He's, he's not that well. We have a wealth of information if we'd start connecting these dots. That's all he does is download information. He has filing cabinets full. And of course, I learned a lot when, when I looked at there and saw what places, what cities in Italy were involved. And um, so I really highly encourage people to uh, talk to the people that are still around about this. I, you know, I'm almost vindicating Alan because he got so much um, uh, hassle about the swamp gas, and you heard him say that he had five minutes to make up something. Cliff already knew that he was like that, that it was not something, that it was very difficult for Alan to, to talk about this. Let's go on with that particular video because I think there's Cliff Stone's testimony. You need to see this, okay? I just came back from Crestone where I did a two and a half hour interview and I will say that we need to acknowledge the Disclosure Project. Let's get off the personality stuff. I think that was one of the of most important things that ever tremendous happened. Tremendous courage to have come forward. We listened to it in Italy. He there was a lot of work career, done there. A full career, retired from the Could U.S. Army. Please turn that up. This Worked was... with the nuclear, biological, and chemical teams as part of his career, and that was in part a cover for other operations in which he personally went to landing and crash sites of extraterrestrial vehicles. This man has personally observed, handled extraterrestrial craft, and has seen and handled living and deceased extraterrestrial biological entities. He has come forward under great duress. I'd like for you to welcome Sergeant Clifford Stone.
it's ironic that we're here in Washington, D.C., and our government states that UFOs don't exist. Uh, this is from the Blue Book files, the overflights of uh, July 19th, 20th, and 26th, 27th of UFOs over Washington, D.C., in which they said they were nothing more than temperature inversions. Of course, the air traffic controllers did not understand that because they were saying they were good, solid returns, craft under, uh, uh, under intelligent control that was exhibiting technologies that we could not do at that time. But then again, no one ever found any pieces, or did they? Actually, a Navy commander found a piece that he turned over to the U.S. government. That piece was never returned. Most people don't know that this exists in the Project Blue Book files. He did his own analysis. Then he asked the Air Force what uh, they thought of the piece. They never returned it. The point I'm trying to get at is that for 22 years in the military, I didn't let my family know what I was doing. And uh, you pay a price for that. My family always thought that I volunteered too much. And I love my country, and I laid down my life for my country as I would today. But my family always thought that it was, I was volunteering. They'd go see my commanders and try to tell them I'm working too much, I'm working too much. Uh, lost 90 days of leave that I had to give back to the U.S. government because I couldn't take the leave. And that upset the family. But what they didn't know is what I'm going to tell you tonight. There were craft that did not originate on the face of this planet. They had living beings in them, living entities, people, very much like you and myself. When I say that, I mean that they had cultures, they had lives, they had families, they had likes, they had dislikes. It wouldn't take me too awful long after being in, exposed to the program where we were doing recoveries that I came to realize this. But then I could never ever tell my family what I was doing. I'm wanting to relate one incident to you, and that one incident is uh, the incident that really propelled me on to that type of situation. And that happened at a place called Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. I was in the 36 Civil Affairs, that's uh, a 36 Civil Affairs company. That's a group that uh, would go out and establish a military government pending the establishment of a civilian government should we be involved in a conflict in which we would take over a foreign country. We would naturally want to return uh, civilian leadership to that country and that would be the job of the civil affairs units in trying to establish that goal. However, each company in 1969 uh, had NBC units and I was a member of the NBC unit. That was my primary job as the unit NBC NCO and the communications NCO. Uh, exact day, month, I can't tell you because I never Never ever plan to relive this, never ever plan to tell a group about this, but I can tell you the year was 1969 when we went out on that uh, field training exercise. Somewhere during the course of the night, we had some people come up and tell us that there was a craft that crashed, uh, possibly a U.S. aircraft, may have some type of nuclear device on it, and we were going to move out to that location, just the NBC team. Uh, you form what's called an NBC quick response team. And when I wasn't on an FTX or uh, doing my normal duties back at the unit in which I was, you would have a staging area where for three days you would be on a 30-minute uh, alert notice to move out should there be an NBC emergency. After that three days, you had another unit come in. There was five units. So out of 15 days, you would pull three days where you were on a three-day alert. When we moved out to the location, we started to approach the location where we were seeing lights. They had the big lights, and I understand those lights are called light alls. We saw that there was some type of craft, like the shape of a hill, that was buried into the ground. Uh, as we approached it, I didn't think too much of it. I was trying to ascertain what type of craft it could be, but I couldn't readily recognize it. Once we did get to our location, what we call our staging area, I immediately started to go ahead setting up the 312 telephones that we needed set up and our PRIC-25 within our communications deuce and a half, and that's what we were using was a deuce and a half for our communications vehicle. 
I set the one Prick 25, which is a field radio, on the company uh, push, then the emergency push that we had for the unit that was out there, which I was assuming was a quick response team to this location. I was immediately told, uh, specialists, do you have a APD-27 on board your vehicle? I turned around and said, yes, sir, I do. He says, get it out and you need to walk toward the craft. We need service, uh, surface readings as to the radiation count. So I started to go ahead, get it, and I was read, uh, walking toward it, and I was yelling out the counts as every time that the Geiger counter would shoot up. Once I got to the craft where it was buried partially at about a 30 degree slant into the ground, I could look down into the craft and I saw what appeared to be a cockpit. The cockpit wasn't open. On the side of the craft was like a kidney shaped hatch that had been fully over it. You couldn't even see the seam. But in this case, it was open. Uh, once I got there, I went ahead and I looked down and I knew what I was looking at wasn't human in our definition of human, in that it was smaller. The head was much larger proportionately than what the head of a human being would be. Uh, it was hanging out over the side, and I was pretty sure it was dead. Uh, alongside of it was another one that uh, was hanging out halfway out. Uh, one arm, one head, and uh, I was getting out higher than average background radiation reading at that time. And I told him that, then I went ahead and I went ahead and I said, I need an officer up here. And all I heard was, it's okay, son, just tell us what you're seeing. I said, no, sir, I don't think you understand. I need an officer up here. And they says, just tell us what you're seeing. And I told them essentially what I've told you tonight. That would be the first case, the first case that I'd ever be involved in as far as make an approach to entities in which we saw that had been killed. I can tell you there were four entities in that crash. Uh, wasn't too awful long after that that I got to see a live one. In that incident, I can tell you we had communications with that entity. And I can tell you one of the words that uh, rang loud and true in my ears, I am afraid. Me and another uh, office, or me and another soldier assisted that entity in escaping. The guy I always called the colonel, who was really the guy that always led the teams that we were on, every team I was on anyhow, he came and was telling me what could happen to me, very angry at me. He said, do you know what the penalties are giving aid and comfort to the enemy? And I said, excuse me, sir, I thought you called him a guest. And he says, well, don't let it happen again. I told him if I, if I was caught in the same situation, I'd do it again. I could identify with that entity's uh, very simple, I won't go into how I knew, but simple verbiage, I am afraid. I mean, you never felt as much pity as what you would have felt at that time. There was a little place called Vietnam. It was only, what, several thousand miles away from home, and I too was afraid at 19. But the whole situation is, these were things we were never going to talk about. These were things that we were never going to bring up. These were things I was going to keep my, from my family. Then the day arrived. I felt that my family had a right to know I wasn't there for certain things. Uh, why sometimes I was quick to snap and why I could never, ever have the luxury of having friends, because I might say something. So when the day finally arrived that I felt that I should tell them, I told them, and I was very afraid even at that time telling them, but I thought they had a right to know. Tonight I come to you as a scared individual, a scared little man, telling you just a piece of what went on in my life. There were other incidences. But I felt you, too, might like to know that that is the case. And I said it yesterday, and I'll say it again, that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. It's evidence that is just simply denied to the American people. I stand here to tell you that before my almighty God, I am willing to go and stand before Congress and tell them what I have told you tonight as being the truth, and I'd interlate more of the events that have occurred.
because I have that moral obligation not only to my family but to every American and every person on the face of this planet. I have that moral obligation possibly even to our visitors. The situation is we're not alone in the universe and I just thought you might like to know. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in what happened after this is Stephen couldn't talk for about five minutes because he was also in tears. You know, I, when I did the interview with him about a, a week and a half ago, um, he said that after this had happened, the Disclosure Project in Washington, so many more people came forward. And even though he's gotten so much hassle, and he said his family has paid for it because you know he has daughters in college and uh, another very young daughter, he's also a grandfather. And people forget that when we talk about people here, they have families, uh, that he will take uh, the new evidence and possibly work on a second try at disclosure because he's, he's right now just concentrating on the CSETI stuff. Um, when someone puts their heart, soul, passion, no matter what their personality is, and believe me, I've dealt with everybody, so I know what the egos are like, and I know what the personalities are like, and I have been with them in Europe. If I list all the people we've brought over, uh, and I just finished bringing Monsignor Car uh, Corrado Balducci to the X conference, he's 83 years old, and it was really very difficult because of his age. I, I brought him over with the wheelchair and so forth. We need to stop looking at the personalities and start looking at the evidence. That, for me, was very powerful. But what I want to tell you is something else. We took that, we translated it into Italian, and the people in Italy gave him a standing ovation because they're looking at all the information from America. Even though you might not think it goes anywhere, they are putting together all of your research, all of the people, my colleagues' research, all of the research, and they are having seminars and major conferences worldwide on the UFO question. When that flyover of Washington happened in 2002, 50 years to the day, and I don't think aliens wear watches, that was a message, a cosmic message, on the front page of Corriere de la Sera, half of the whole entire newspaper, as Essen had shown in her Turkish newspaper slides, half of the Corriere de la Sera in Italy had the flyover of Washington and talked about that and the second page had the follow-up. When the Mexican Air Force case came out in Mexico, it was on the nightly news for two nights, and the commentator was intelligent enough to also compare it to the lights in Hesdalen in Norway because he had background. It does happen other places. There it is out there. Uh, it is being disseminated. People are thinking it's pretty normal. It's no big deal. Uh, and when this happens in Europe, it's a lot easier to deal with it than it is here. My job is just to bring personalities back and forth and to bring the disclosure. It's not about me at all. It's about the message. It's about the disclosure. It's about what needs to come for forward. I've been told I have 20 minutes, and I have four videos, so I have to decide what to do. Most of you, if you haven't seen the Jaime Maussan video, I want to show it to you because that's recent. Could somebody um, play that right now? It's the flyover of Washington, D.C. of all the, uh, the UFOs. Could you play that piece? I think I, I um, uh, did cue it up. In the film, if you can get it, UFOs have begun. Uh, it, it has begun, UFOs, it has begun. That's narrated by... Um, Rod Serling, and has Jacques Vallée in it and Alan Hynek in it. There is a piece that resembles the Jaime Maussan video. It is a long piece in that, uh, and I have it here, but I can't really show it if I'm going to show the rest. It looks just like the flyover of Mexico City on May 25th. It was in Utah, because I know people have said to me, how come they can be seen in Mexico City? And we don't have it in the United States, we did. And Heineck in that documentary says, he says, well, you know, he said the Robinson panel, look at it, and they called it birds. So we did have that kind of phenomenon in the 70s. Do you have that film footage that you can show so people can, because not everybody's seen that, just a few minutes of it, it's already queued. Uh, and we made some analysis to this craft, and we detect heat. Can we fast forward then because it's, you can, because I want you to, there they are, okay. City again. There they are. 
the huge flotilla over Mexico City. If we are not going to use the lights, I, could we turn them off? I think people are going to see better if we can turn these lights off, please. The, several yes. times, but the, the time that I'm thinking of is the 25th of, of uh, May of this year. If that's happening over are you, Mexico As you City, see, they are standing still this time. They don't move. They're not birds. OK, you can stop it now. And if you put on Travis Walton uh, next. Um, I guess my message to you, because I have very little time to talk. I mean, I could go on for two and three hours on the amount of information. I put together, and it was quite serendipitous, the, the same di persone footage. rapite. Io non so se la nostra musica che sottolinea questo momento perché oggi noi vi vogliamo raccontare una storia molto particolare così per cercare di gettare anche un po' di luce di più su quello che è un grande dubbio siamo soli nell'universo è un onore per me presentarvi quest'oggi Mr. Travis Walton Mr. Travis Walton Travis Walton è una, è una storia molto particolare la sua, forse la più importante storia che la Rai Radio Televisione Italiana poteva permettermi di incontrare. Mr. Travis Walton è il più famoso rapito dagli extraterrestri della storia. Questo uomo ha 50 anni, è nato in Arizona, e nel il 5 novembre del 1975 è stato rapito dagli extraterrestri. La sua storia è talmente ricca di particolari, ricca di coincidenti testimonianze, è la storia più famosa che sia mai stata vissuta e raccontata che nel 1993 ne è stato tratto anche un There's film movie, Fire in the Sky, and it's been translated into io vorrei Italian. con lei Bolton, ripercorrere questa storia affinché la sua vicenda fosse anche per noi motivo di ulteriori ragionamenti motivo di ulteriori said, suggestioni sulla vita extraterrestre allora, quel 5 novembre del 1975 lei era con dei suoi amici friends, passeggiando said, in un bosco e vorrei sapere come è successo tutto <laughs> quello che è successo e poi ci cosa è successo Um, I was working, I was one of seven men. Io facevo parte di un gruppo di sette persone, okay, eravamo dei boschi. Stop that, stop that. I, I'm going to talk about, in, in the next one is a Corso film, but I, don't put it on yet because I want to make some comments about that. Travis came to Italy, and what happened is a group of people put him in a seminar, which is what I hope we do with all our speakers in the future. And they all asked him questions, and somebody said, what was the UFO doing there, which is a logical question. What is it doing in the forest? It is not on vacation. Those Uh, UFOs over Mexico City are not having a vacation. Uh, and they asked him, uh, why do you think it was there? And his wife just blurred out, well, she said there had been some atomic testing done in Mexico and in um, uh, their town of Snowflake, there were several court cases uh, against the American government because people had contracted leukemia. And there was a heavy, heavy flow of radiation in that forest and all around there, which could answer the reason why it's there. Uh, and uh, she said, maybe they were like measuring the radiation. And then she said, then Travis said, well, you know, he said, nobody's come down to follow up on my story. The trees are growing at least 30% bigger in that area. Well, I think the horticulturists and botanists should get on this because if we can get science to look at this seriously, it's snowflake. like he's given up. He's very, very discouraged because we got to talk to him in Italy. People just adored him. He's real. Uh, but his story needs to be followed up. His book has been stopped. You cannot get a Travis Walton book because a publisher won't publish it. If I ever have money someday, I'm going to re-release that book. That is a real book that people can read about a real case. And books like that, like that book and several other books, are no longer being published. He can't afford it. He's still working his job in the paper mill. These are things that are so important that we, we take note of. The very last, and I'm trying to rush so I can have you go out in time. I do, do not want to keep you. You can ask me questions. I will be at the book table. The last story is the Colonel Corso story. 
Now, what I'd like you to t what I'd like to tell you is the story is in my book because when Victor I went to do the interview division. with Corso, e poi, eh, torno dalla this Germania, is the Tonight eh, Show in Italy. Italy. So I'll let you see this and then I'll make a comment. The Tonight Show, the Jane Leno Show. That's americano. who that is. The most there important I found person out what this in our television. Was 14 years before. E fu così che 14 anni dopo scoprì di che cosa eh, si trattava la scoperta di 14 anni prima. Our own laboratory that we financed and belonged to us, the Army Research, uh, had made an autopsy report on this being. Questo laboratorio aveva fatto una autopsia su questo essere. And the autopsy report came to me. Ho avuto modo di leggere questa autopsia. And at this point, not only did I learn what, what was in those caskets, e così non solo appresi che cosa c'era in queste famose scatole che vidi allora, but General Trudeau, my, my superior, Ma il mio superiore, generale Trudeau, appointed me head of the Foreign Technology Division and gave me the files. E mi diede l'incarico di eh, poter dirigere questo centro di ricerca e mi diede tutti i files relativi a questo, oh, questo report di autopsia. And in the file I found artifacts from the crash in Roswell. E fu così che grazie a questi file ritrovai questi manufatti del, dello schianto di Oswell. And I was given the orders to do what had to be done with them, find out in the government, in the industry, in the universities, in the army, what we're doing along those lines of these things we had. E quindi mi fu dato l'incarico di vedere eh, nel settore di governo, industria e via dicendo che cosa si faceva con questo tipo di manufatti. Now at this stage I want to tell the audience don't think that we were so brilliant that we knew what we had. Adesso vorrei dire a questo punto al pubblico, non pensate che eh, pensavamo di essere così brillanti, di sapere esattamente che cosa ci trovavamo di fronte. But we had an instinct and we gradually fit, gave us out the industry and they uh, who were working in that direction in our own laboratories and we gave these items out, not the item itself, but the research and development project. Però diciamo che da questo materiale noi avevamo avuto qualche spunto, qualche idea, dal quale poi abbiamo tratto le, le ricerche che sono state affidate ai vari settori industriali. And to show you how difficult this was, I had a little thing that looked like a flashlight. Per esempio, per dirvi eh, quanto tutto questo era complesso, avevo questo piccolo oggetto che poteva sembrare come una piccola torcia. Which came from the, from the crash. Che eh, era uno dei eh, resti di questo famoso schianto. It had uh, indentations and lines on it. E c'erano sopra delle incisioni. And I couldn't get it to come on. E non riuscivo ad attivarlo. So, like a typical stupid human being. Così come un tipico eh, essere umano un po' stupido. I said, the battery's dead. Ho pensato, vabbè, I figured. forse la batteria non funziona più. And it wasn't all the battery. Ma non era la questione della batteria. A few months later, I took it to our atomic laboratory at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Qualche mese dopo, lo portai al nostro laboratorio atomico nella Virginia. And I asked the commander, turn radiation on this object and long low waves frequency. E gli dissi, eh, attivate le radiazioni su questo oggetto. And it came on. Ed ecco che si illuminò. So then I reported back to the general, we send it to our electronic laboratories in the hospital, because it, it was measuring brain waves. It yeah. was measuring brain waves, that's real interesting. Che ha detto? Oh, Dr. Tzia, what did he say? L'autopsia uh, ha detto questo. And he spoke questo. Italian, so. Questo, mm -hmm. this e being, we called them extraterrestrial biological entity. Noi li chiamavamo entità extraterrestri biologiche, EBA. Because it was, an extra, it was a biological entity. Perché si trattava sempre di un'entità extraterrestre and, biologica. And the autopsy said this. L'autopsia ha detto quanto segue. It had four lobes in the brain. Quattro lobi nel cervello. We only have two. Noi ce ne abbiamo soltanto due. It had no vocal cords. Non aveva corde <coughs> vocali. It had no... Uh, Alimentary canal for food. There was no food aboard. Non aveva eh, esofago, non aveva modo di mangiare, alimentarsi. There was no water aboard. Non aveva modo di bere. So there was no rest quarters. E quindi non vi erano i generi alimentari che normali che avrei potuto ingerire. Our own astronauts in space, we have to time down when they go to sleep. There was nothing like that aboard. 
non c'era eh, nulla che eh, gli facesse pensare una vita normale come noi esseri umani, anche di dormire e mangiare. They didn't breathe air. Non respiravano aria. There was no oxygen aboard. Non c'era ossigeno a bordo. So I was asked, how do they live? How do they propagate? E allora io mi sono chiesto, ma come fanno a vivere? Come fanno anche a, a pro, eh, moltiplicarsi, proliferare? The, the asked me that. Questa è una domanda che lo stesso generale mi pose. So I, I told him I read Tesla's reports, the great scientist Tesla. E eh, io ho letto questo report di questo grande scienziato, Tesler. And he said our own cells are electromagnetic. E, eh, e gli dice le nostre stesse cellule sono elettromagnetiche. So they must propagate by electromagnetism. Allora, we, we eh, questi off, EV uh, probabilmente si moltiplicano. You know, I spent a lot of time, of course, so, but so did my boss, Maurizio Baiada. We translated his book. I wrote the preface to his book, but mostly he spoke twice in Italy. Once at a huge conference in San Marino, uh, and another one, no, time in Pescara. At the Pescara conference, there was present Michael Lindemann, um, Jim Courant, Bill Hamilton, Desmond Leslie. All those people spoke to Corso. All those people had time with him. Jim Courant even did an interview with him. All of them found him credible. At the San Marino conference, he was lucky enough to mix with uh, the Chinese representative, Boris Chernoff from Russia, um, from the French representative, Gilles Dabourdet. I'm really encouraging us all to do more international work. Those people were able to speak with him. He left uh, us with papers. My editor, Maurizio Baiata, may come to the United States next year. He will bring some of the Corso material that Corso left with us in Italy. He loved Italy, he, he is of Italian extraction, but most of all, that was the venue where he could speak the uh, clearest. And what I encourage you to do is to uh, listen to Maurizio, because he will have not only unedited Corso material, but he will talk about um, what Corso left us. A book was written called The Dawning of a New Age. It's on the public domain and all the newsstands in Italy, which are the original Corso notes. They have not been printed here. So there is so much more. Please ask questions. There is so much more to the story than one thinks. Do our homework is very important. Let's look at it as let's not take the, na the word of just somebody. I do not do anything and nothing in my book is without facing the person, visiting the person. Clark McClellan at NASA, I had to go down. He uh, wanted to do a story. I wanted to know if there had been UFOs. Uh, involved with NASA. I had to go down there. I wasn't going to do the interview on the phone, and I wanted to look at him. I wanted to see other things he had. Everybody in there I have gone to visit. Dr. Michael Wolf, I won't even get into that. When we started doing that story, we were visited by the intelligence community of Rome. They sat on the table, looked at my editor, and said, and they named him with his whole name, because we were just calling him Michael Wolf. They said, you're doing a story on Michael Wolf Cravant, and we said, yeah, we are. And they said, he was here in Rome. He is legit. He worked here. And the, the, the person was an intelligence person. And they just said, be careful. Because one of the reasons for all the negativity, ne negativity too, is because the person usually was in the intelligence situation. We were, we were told that at our offices. So you know, a lot of this is very important, only to connect the dots, to figure out. Now, with all the things I've shown you, and I know you're on overload, we have people walking around, or guests, as Clifford called them, as Charles Hall called them. So we're way beyond the sighting situation. We need to look at the witnesses before we don't have them anymore. Uh, we need to tie together the whole entire story. Please try to get the video called uh, UFOs it has begun, because I'm convinced that was an acclamation video. I was shocked to see uh, a recreation of the Holloman landing there with a piece of UFO that's landing in Holloman. I'm convinced that they were trying to release that. What's Jacques Vallée doing in that? And part of that it has begun is filmed in the Pentagon. And here's Rod Serling uh, in that film uh, talking about it has begun. So I don't know if you've ever seen that. But try to get that because it has the flotilla that I showed you that, that looks like the Jaime Maussan flotilla and Alan talking about that in that film. 
I want to end with a paranormal experience because I was such a nuts and bolts person, I used to throw out anything that was paranormal. And I have learned so much in these 30 years. Um, when uh, uh, Colonel Corso was with us in Europe, he had his grandchildren. That was part of the deal. You bring my grandchildren, I'll come, I'll speak, I'll do everything. And he brought his daughter-in-law. And I'm wrapping up with this. And his daughter and I were really worried because Corso had all this handwritten stuff that he had remembered from his days in back engineering. In fact, a gentleman probably that's here tonight gave me some more handwritten material that Corso had sent him because he called Corso and asked about the alien autopsy. And so this gentleman showed me here at this conference four pages that Corso had given him. But anyway, he was given this all on. I was freaked out by it. I said to his daughter-in-law, he can't do that. We, he can't just give it to anybody. He's, no, he's given this stuff to us. So we hid his briefcase. And poor Colonel, he'd say, did you happen to see my briefcase? He said, I had this stuff. I want to give this doctor. I want him to understand. Because what you didn't understand here is that that alien body had a microchip, one in one eye and one in one of the lobes of the brain. And the colonel was just in, uh, infatuated with um, the idea of the microchip plus the, uh, the electromagnetic stuff. And so we hit it. We hit it. And um, he was upset. Uh, we just told him we didn't know where it was and so forth. Many years later, after the death of Corso, I encountered a psychic, a Native American lady. And we were talking. And she said, I have to tell you something. And I said, what? She said, do you know a military man with a lot of you know, medals? And I said, oh, no. I said, yeah, he passed away in 1998. She said, he wants you to have his briefcase. I was so upset. She couldn't know that. There's no way she could know that. She said, get his briefcase. He wants you to talk. He wants you to get his briefcase. So of course, I called the family. And I said, you know, I don't know how to tell you this because I'm really freaked out by me, but Colonel wants me to have his briefcase. So you have that briefcase we used to hide? And his daughter-in-law, who's a sweetheart, Liz, and she and I are still in communication. She said, you're going to get that briefcase, but they give it to me empty. So <laughs> I have the colonel's briefcase. Uh, and everywhere I go, where I speak, I bring it along because for some reason, he wants me to have the briefcase. I thank you so much for atten your attention. And I hope that I stimulated your thinking. And let's go on and do this, because we will get this out. Thank you. What a wonderful, what a wonderful pro We are in Fullerton, California. There is something flying in the sky. It is moving around, changing colors from green to red. It's stopping in midair, blinking, stopping in going mid -air. back and forth. 
So now it's going diving. And then it'll go up. This is a not something that's natural. Look at this. What the fuck is that? I swear to God, I've never seen nothing like that, ever. It just disappeared. Let's go out in the front. Come on, let's go see in the front. What the fuck is that? Oh God. 